So for anybody who has not um, been following my father-in-law's story thus far, uh, you would not know who I am, but uh, my name is Heather Escalante. And my family last year went through an extremely horrible tragedy that unfortunately is still ongoing today, 11 months later. Um, I am using this YouTube channel to bring awareness to my father-in-law's case, um, as well as a lot of other cases in the same area where he went missing from last year. Um, we do think that some of these cases may be connected as far as who is responsible for what happened to them. Um, but even the ones that are not related, there is something really crazy going on out in the area where this is all transpiring in the terms of law enforcement. Um, and so I, I want to bring awareness to these things. Um, you know, there are, for anybody who is unaware, there are over 600,000 people who go missing in the U.S. alone every year. That is a very astounding number. Um, that's a number I can't even begin to wrap my head around. And up until last year, I never thought this would happen to me. My family never thought this would happen to us. Um, but it can happen to you. Um, you know, we're just everyday normal people who have now been uh, thrown into a club we never wanted to be a part of that you get a lifelong membership to, whether you want one or not. Um, so in saying that, um, welcome to Justice for James Escalante. I do appreciate you watching this far. And um, with that being said, I am going to start going into some things regarding my father-in-law's case. Um, I'll start with some basic things. And as more and more videos come out, more and more things will be revealed. Um, I do hope that you decide to stick with me through this journey and through this story. Um, you can also find my father-in-law story on Facebook. It is a private group. Um, but you can find it. It is called Justice for James Escalante. Um, so feel free to join that as well. Please help us share his flyers, get his name, get his face out there, share these videos. Um, you know, the more that his story gets told, the more that his face is out there, the more awareness we bring to the situation, the more likely we will be to get answers. Um, because someone does know something somewhere. And, um, you know, we're just hoping that one day that person's conscience gets the conscience, excuse me, gets the best of them and they decide to come forward. Um, so, uh, my father-in-law, James Michael Escalante went missing from Wonder Valley, California on or around June 25th of 2020. I say on or around because the only person who has been able to, or the, excuse me, the only people who have provided dates for his um, last known whereabouts um, prior to him going missing were people that uh, I personally believe are people of interest and possible suspects in his disappearance and death. Um, Wonder Valley is a uh, little, I say little, land mass wise, it is not little, but it is a town um, right outside of 29 Palms, California, uh, near the Joshua Tree National Park. Um, if you look up Wonder Valley, it is huge land mass wise. It is a little shy of 150 square miles of land, however, Unlike most places that large, it population-wise is very, very small. It has less than a thousand residents in that area. Um, I think it's closer to around 600 if I'm not mistaken. Um, so this is not a situation like a big city like LA or Atlanta. It's not even a like a mid-sized city or even a small city for that matter. I mean, this is like 
There's nothing out there, guys. It is desert. It's part of the Mojave Desert. There's nothing out there. There's some abandoned shacks. There are some, um, you know, uh, a few homes with people in it. Very few places of business. Um, and a lot of desert and mountains. So there's nothing out there. There's no one out there. Which is why the story, as it unfolds, will become stranger and stranger. Um, if you take into consideration all factors. Um, so on or around June 25th of 2020, James was, um, had a girlfriend at the time. Her name was Sherry Slover. And from what we've been able to understand and figure out, she is the last known person to speak, to see or speak to James before he went missing and was found deceased. Um, on the morning, uh, she claims that on the morning of June 25th, that her friend, who goes by the name of Dashe, or was she, I'm sorry, her name is Dashe Waters. She goes by the name D. Uh, Sherry's nickname around town is also Tigger, for the record. Um, so uh, Sherry and D were friends. Um, D supposedly went out rock hunting around like 3.30, 4.30 in the morning. Um, I don't know what you're going to find at that hour with no street lights, no nothing, but this is the story as we've been told. Um, and she went out rock hunting at that hour. Um, she ended up getting her vehicle stuck in what they call sugar sand. It was an SUV, gold color SUV. And um, she got her, her vehicle stuck in what they call sugar sand out there in the desert, looking for rocks at Odark 30. Uh, she attempted to find a friend to come help her get unstuck. Um, that did not happen. She then contacted Sherry to see if Sherry could help get her unstuck because her friend could not come until after they got off work. Sherry claims that at that time, and I would love to let you know what time that was. However, um, in the several times that she's repeated her story, that time frame has changed almost every single time she's told the story. So I have no idea exactly what time he actually may have left that day or if any of this story is even true. Um, it started out with her saying that uh, very early that morning, 8, 8.30, um, that she sent James out. Uh, now, James did not drive. Um, she sent him out on a mountain bike to go rescue Dee from the desert. Um, at that time, uh, per, well, Per Google Maps, that is an 11-minute bike ride from where Sherry and James were living to the intersection where James was supposedly said to have made his last phone call from, which would have been very close to where D was allegedly broken or uh, was allegedly stuck. So she then claimed that several hours passed, and at that point, she got a call from James saying that he was at the intersection of Highway 62 and Shelton Road in Wonder Valley, California, that um, she D was supposed to have been stuck near that intersection. Uh, and he stated he could not find her. She claims that at that time, she then called D on a three-way call. They got on the call together. They explained to D where James was. They asked her to beep her horn so that James could find her. She began beeping her horn. James said, I got it. He hung up and no one ever saw or heard from him again. Later that afternoon, um, two men claimed to have gone out into the desert and helped Dee get her vehicle unstuck from the sugar sand. And these two gentlemen, and I'm using that term lightly, um, are named Gary Balch and a, another man named Tyson Turner, who goes by the name Tank. 
Now, Tank was not only um, supposedly a friend to Sherry, um, but he was also her on-again, off-again boyfriend of over eight years. Um, he was living there on the same property with James and Sherry at this time. He had recently gotten out of jail. Um, it is my understanding that while he was in jail, that is when James and Sherry got together. Um, he has been known to be very, very jealous of Sherry. Uh, to this day, is still that way. Um, and I do have proof of that, that we'll talk about much later down the, down the road from this story, but he's very, very jealous of Sherry. Um, so I feel like that's important to note as well. Uh, so the story goes that um, Tank was actually at work with Gary that morning. Gary was the friend that Dee was trying to originally get to come help her, as well as Tank, but they both told her that they could not come until they got off work. Uh, Gary um, dropped Tank off at the house with Sherry um, to go to an appointment. I want to say it was a doctor's appointment. And then came back and picked Dee up from her vehicle. He tried to get it unstuck and could not. He took Dee because she was at that point starting to show signs of um, heat exhaustion. He put her in his vehicle. He took her to Sherry's house where they claimed she then had some sort of heat stroke type episode. He picked Tank up. They went back out to Dee's vehicle. They got it unstuck together. And then they drove, um, Gary drove his truck while Tank drove Dee's vehicle. They got him back. They got Dee's vehicle back to Sherry's house. Gary left. He went home. Nobody looked for James. Nobody reported him missing. Nobody called his friends to see if they had seen him or heard from him. They kept trying to call him. He was not answering. They were texting, so they claim he was not responding. But they never once went to look for him. Even though they were out there with two vehicles, they never went to look for him. On August 8th of 2020, very early in the morning again, around 8, 8.30 in the morning, um, a local resident was out hunting rabbits and came across a set of human remains. He called them into the authorities. They were picked up. At this time, James had not been reported missing. Now, again, we're talking from June 25th to August 8th. He had not been reported missing at this point. Um, I'm going to back up one second because in July... I want to say it was the 24th. I'm so sorry. I don't have my dates with me. I kind of did the spur of the moment um, because I've been meaning to do this for a while. And I just have not had the, the time to do that um, due to a lot of other factors. But I do know it was in July, towards the end of July. A set of remains was found, give or take about a mile, from the residence where Sherry and Tank were and, and James were living at the time that he went missing. It is my understanding that either those remains to this day are still unidentified or if they've been identified, the public has not been notified of that. But there was another set of human remains found, skeletal remains, in July. My father-in-law's remains, or what turned out to be verified as my father-in-law's remains, were found on August 8th. So very close together. Um, as far as dates go, and at some point, I will be sharing a map with a lot of pens, which I will explain, and it will make a lot of this make a lot more sense as far as the vicinity of everything and how close together everything is in such a, a, a densely populated area. Um, James's bike that he left on was recovered, and that was found right on Shelton Road right off of Highway 62. So if he did stop there to make that three-way call, as that's the claim, it was literally just left right there. But his remains were found a good distance from that bike, out in the mountains, or out in the desert, heading towards nothing but mountains. He had passed several homes. He could have seen where Dee's car was supposedly broken down at well before he got to where his body was found. 
it makes no sense where his remains were found. Um, family was eventually notified and we did file a missing, uh, missing persons report on James on September 7th. So he went missing without the police knowing that he had been missing from June 25th, give or take, to August 8th. Um, that is when the missing persons, or excuse me, September 7th, when we filed the missing persons report. <clears throat> I then took to social media. I made missing persons flyers. I started putting them out there. I started joining groups. Um, unfortunately, my husband and I live in South Carolina, so we were not local to the area to be able to do anything on foot, um, you know, arrange kind of search teams or or do much of anything from such a distance. And so I did take the social media at that time and I started putting uh, missing flyers out for James. I started joining some of the um, community Facebook groups and pages for that area and sharing his missing persons flyers there. Um, through doing so, I was contacted privately by a person that was telling me that they had found human remains on August 8th. After speaking with this person, there was enough um, information that I was already becoming a little concerned that, given the description of things, this could have been my father-in-law's remains. So, I, of course, trying to remain hopeful, I still continued to try to search for him as a missing person. Because if it wasn't him, I didn't want to lose time looking for him. So we found that out um, September 9th. And September 10th was the first time that we ever spoke with Sherry Slover, my husband and I, ever. We did not know about her. Um, we did not have any way to contact her. She, If she had a way to contact us, she wasn't using it. And um, the only reason why we got in contact with her then is because through one of those same groups, she saw my post and commented on it and asked if I would please contact her and gave me her number. So after discussing it with my husband, he decided he would be the one to call. He called her the night of September the 10th. That whole conversation was just, in my, my personal opinion, an insanely telling conversation. So my husband calls her. She answers the phone. He says, you know, hi, Sherry. This is James's son, John. We got your message on Facebook. My wife told me about it. So I'm calling you. She immediately goes into, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm so, so sorry. And then says, your dad gave me a ring to give to you and I'm wearing it and I'm going to keep wearing it until I see you and can give it to you. My husband then asked her, you know, what happened? When did he go missing? What, what was going on at that time? What was he wearing? Like what information can you give us? What details can you give us? This is when we first heard the story about, um, you know, the friend being stuck in the sugar sand and, and all these things. And he we then found out what he was wearing. Um, and it so closely matched the details that I got from the person who had found those remains on August 8th that I, at that point, just got sick to my stomach because I felt like there was very little chance that those were not my father-in-law's remains out there that had been located. Um, we then asked her because we had have, we still have connections out in the desert as far as friends and things like that. And so we had attained a picture of the bike that had been out there off of Shelton Road and was still sitting out there. Um, and we asked her, would you recognize the bike that he left on? She said, absolutely. It was my bike. So I texted it to her from my phone while him and her were still on the phone together. And she said, oh yeah, that's my bike. That's the bike he left on. So then we knew that was his bike and it was found close enough to those remains that we were concerned. So I did alert the police that it was still out there. They went and picked it up the next day. They had no idea that it was connected at the time that they collected the remains. Because again, James had not been reported missing at that time. Um, we got a description of, you know, like I said, the whole day from her 
We got the date. We got all this information that she was giving us. We said, okay, thank you. It was at this point, mind you, throughout this whole conversation, she is re referring to James in the past tense. Then she says she heard his body was found propped up against a mountain, sitting up against, or I'm sorry, yeah, propped up against a, a mountain um, with his bike and his phone next to him. And we were a little perplexed by that. And we were like, well, to our knowledge, his body has not been found, actually. Um, and we did not tell her about the remains at that time because we just did not want to release that information at that time because we had not even spoken with the police about it or the coroner's office, you know, in, it, with the fact that we thought they could be James's remains. And we did not want to release that at that time. So we did not say anything to her about the remains at that time. At that point... Um, she did, you know, we asked her, do you have any recent picture, more recent pictures of him? I mean, you see him all the time. Y'all live together. Do you have some recent pictures we, you can send us? She's texted us some pictures of him and different things like that. And then my husband went to let her go. We thanked her for her time, thanked her for the information and the pictures and told her, I'm sure we'll be in touch. And at that time they went to hang up and Sherry ended the call with saying this to my husband. Can you please let me know when his services will be, will be? I'd like to attend if possible. Um, that immediately set my gut off. It was a red flag for me. There were so many red flags in that conversation. One, she referred to him in the past tense the entire conversation. Not once did she refer to him in the present tense. Um, two, she... Uh, wanted to be notified of his final services when all we knew was that he was missing. We had nothing to go off of that he had been, you know, that he was deceased. And then the ring thing, that really got me because it made no sense. Um, from a logical perspective, it made no sense to me because James and John had each other's phone numbers so he wanted to give his son something. Why wouldn't he reach out to his son and say, hey, son, I want to give you something. What's your address? Also, my husband and I have children from, each have children from our previous relationships prior to meeting one another. One of his children lives with us in South Carolina. This child's mother lives in 29 Palms and had pretty frequent communications with James. James knew that my stepson was living in our home. He knew that we were in both my husband and I and his grandson all had regular contact with my husband's ex. He also knew that she mailed us packages regularly for my stepson. So if he wanted to get something to John, why wouldn't he give it to her to send to us? Why would he, out of nowhere, want to give his son something and give it to a lady who did not know us, who did not have a way to contact us, who we did not know, who we did not have a way to contact? It just doesn't add up to me. It's a very bizarre statement. It's a very fishy statement. And it immediately set my gut off. I was just flabbergasted by the way this conversation went. And I immediately just felt sick. So based on the fact um, that the information she provided combined with the information that we had received from the person who had found these remains on August 8th, we were obviously leaning towards the fact that these could possibly be James's remains. So the following day, which would have been 9-11, um... And I hope I'm getting my dates right. I really do because I'm not sitting at my computer right now. I was going to sit out there, but my husband is washing the car with a pressure washer. So it's pretty loud. So I didn't want that to be the primary noise of my video. So I came upstairs instead. So I didn't have my laptop with all my information on it. So and it's got my timeline on it. So I apologize if I have made any date errors. I will correct myself in a future video. Um, so... Next day, we get in touch with the coroner's office, and we I talked to the coroner. He, you know, the coroner's office said, yeah, you may want to come see what we can figure out here. 
We knew that it was skeletal, so fingerprints would not be a means of identification. We could not find any dental records on James, so our next, our only option left was DNA comparison. So we did immediately that night fly out, my husband and I flew out to California so that we could collect DNA, anything that may contain his DNA to get to the coroner's office and have my husband submit DNA for comparison against those remains to find out if they were James's or not. We get out there. We did not really let much of anybody know we were even coming and it was a very last minute trip, obviously. And um, so we get out there and we text Sherry Slover and say, hey, you know, we're in town. Um, we need to see about collecting some of James's belongings. We have found out that there are some remains. Then we need to have a DNA comparison done to see if they're his. Is there any way that you can meet us out at the Wonder Valley Fire Station, which is typically unmanned, um, and, you know, let us follow you out to James's. Um, James was, and her were both living in, a, in like, camper trailers um, at the back of a property. And the reason they were doing that is because Sherry was supposedly a caretaker for the gentleman who was living in the home who also passed away last summer. Um, and they were actually in the process of moving because once that gentleman died, uh, Dennis was his name. I do not know his last name. Um, the homeowner, which I think was Dennis's dad, decided he wanted to sell the home and told them they needed to get off of the property so that it could be sold. So they were actually in the middle of packing up and trying to move when all of this transpired. Um, so we follow her out to James's trailer that he was living in at the time. His camper trailer was a little fifth wheel trailer and she lets us in. We let her, we tell her the items that the coroner said would be of use for as far as, you know, DNA, possible DNA collection. And she went through his things. We did not go through his things. She went through his things and gave us some items that fit the list that we got from the coroner's office. We packaged those items up and we, you know, went and submitted those to the coroner's office the next, uh, a few days later, um, before we left. And, um, you know, that way they could start the process to do DNA analysis on these remains and, and do a comparison. When we first got to the Wonder, Vire, Wonder Valley Fire Station, sorry, tongue twister for me today, um, we get there and Sherry and Tank actually pull up together in a pickup truck and they pull in behind us at the fire station. We were in a rental car, a little four-door sedan. Um, we all get out the cars, you know, we would get, all get out of our vehicles and we meet in between the two vehicles and introduce ourselves. And Sherry immediately hands my husband a ring and tells him that's the ring that she had told him about on the phone and a necklace, a sil you know, a silver necklace, silver and turquoise ring, and then a keychain that was like a little mini flask or whatever that she said, you know, his dad loved and she wanted him to have those things. We thanked her. Then she informs us that she's going to have to ride with us to James's trailer because Tank needs to get back to their new place because they're almost out of gas and their truck does not have tags, legal tags on it. So Tank leaves, heads to their new place. Sherry gets in the car with my husband and I and we ride out to James's trailer to do all that. While we are there collecting those belongings, she starts telling us, you know, I don't, we were talking about James going missing and she said, you know, I don't know why I didn't think of this before and that it could be possibly connected. But that same day when Dee got back to my house, she was telling me that she witnessed a hit and run at that intersection between a vehicle and a bike. I never stopped to think that that could have possibly been James. Okay, really? Um, and I said, well, you know, would Dee be willing to speak with me? I would I'd really like to ask her some questions about that. She says, well, she hasn't really been answering my calls much lately. Let me check. I'll see if I can get a hold of her right now. So she gets on her phone. I don't know who she talked to or if she was even talking to a real person. Um, however, she did get on the phone and claims that she was talking to Dee. 
and was asking Dee about the hit and run. She said she had not been, that she didn't have any information to give on it other than what she'd already said. And, um, we couldn't find any record of it. We even asked the police to check. There was no record of a hit and run. Sherry's statement later changed on that as well. Um, so we weren't sure about this hit and run theory and there was no damage to the bike that was um, in line with being involved in a hit and run. So it didn't make any sense. Um, so we did all the DNA compare, or you know, we did the DNA submission from my husband and we did submit articles that contained James's DNA to the coroner's office while we were out on that trip. Um, we also visited the site where the remains were found just because we wanted to see where it was. We wanted to get an idea in our head of, of what are we talking here? You know, it's, it's different when you see something in person. It really is um, very eye-opening. So we did go out to the location where the remains had been found and there were still even two clumps of hair there and there were animal droppings, and um, it was a very surreal place to be standing, and it was just very, very eye-opening to, to see where a body ended up that truly just made no sense for it to be. Um, we then, of course, went home, and two weeks later, approximately two weeks later, um, I'd still been in communications with Sherry pretty regularly at that point, and I had asked her, and we'd asked her in the very beginning, the very first phone call, was he wearing any jewelry? Did he have his wallet? Did he have his phone? Did he have that? You know, like we were, you know, did he take his keys? What did he have with him? You know, we were trying to figure all this out, so we'd have as much information as possible. During that initial call, she said no, he was not wearing any jewelry, which we thought was a little strange because James wore jewelry, at, you know, pretty much all the time. Um, so about a week or two later, after we get back, I want to say it was closer to two weeks, um, Sherry just texts me out of nowhere. And she's like, oh my God, I can't believe I didn't think about, you know, that I couldn't remember, I didn't remember this before, but James was wearing jewelry when he went missing. He was wearing two silver and turquoise rings. I said, oh wow, that's okay, that's something. Um, what did they look like? Do you have any pictures of them? Can you give me a description? Something. I mean, silver and turquoise is rather vague. So she said, well, it's these. And she sends me a picture. And it's a very blurry picture. Um, grainy. He's holding a puppy. He's moving his hands. Well, in the picture. So, I mean, like, even though the picture is grainy, we might have been able to make some level of detail out on these rings had he not been moving his hands, which blurred them further. So they weren't very helpful other than I got a vague, vague idea of what they might look like. And I asked her, I said, well, do you have any better pictures? I mean, that's, that's kind of hard to see in those pictures. And she said, no, I really don't have any other pictures. But, you know, they were, it, so she kind of goes into a better, slightly more detailed description of the two rings. I said, okay, thank you. So I kind of let it go at that point. And I didn't say anything else to her. And I started looking on my phone. And I went through my pictures of James that I had on my phone. And every picture that had his hands in it, I zoomed in just to see what I could see. And lo and behold, I zoom in on one and I have much better quality pictures on my phone than she apparently has on hers. And so I zoom in on this picture on his hands and lo and behold, there are two rings on one hand right next to each other, just like in her picture. They were both silver and turquoise. And the shapes from what I could make out from her picture were spot on. They looked to be pretty spot on from what I could make out to her picture. So I screenshotted that zoomed in view of his hands and I sent it to her and I said, hey, are these the rings he was wearing? This is a better picture. I can see more detail with this. And she says, yeah, those are the rings that he was wearing when he went missing. And I was like, hmm, okay, thanks. So waited a little while, a couple of hours for my husband to get home from work because I didn't want to call him with this you know, stuff at work. So we got home and I asked him, hey, where's that ring? that Sherry gave you of your dad's that she claims that he gave to her to give to you. He's kind of looking at me funny, and he's like, well, it's upstairs. Why? And I said, can you please go get that for me? He's looking at me like I've lost my marbles. And I said, well, you all, you, you know me. You've known me long enough to know that there's a method to my madness. I really do need to see that ring. So he went and got it, and he brought it down to me. And I didn't say a word. I opened up that zoomed-in shot of the rings in my picture, and I 
hold that up next to the ring itself that Sherry had given my husband when we were there. And lo and behold, it's the same ring. I point, I hand my phone and my, and the ring over to my husband. And I said, can you please look at these two? You have much better vision than me. I'm blind as a bat. Check these out and tell me, you know, what you see. And he didn't even look at it for like three seconds. And he was like, oh, this is the same ring. This, this one right here that she gave me is this one right here in the picture. He's like pointing at it, you know, like this. And he's like, yeah, that's the same ring. Um, so it really was his. And I said, yeah, it really was his. And I said, but here's the part that's the clincher. So I back out of the picture and I go into my messages between Sherry and I. And I said, start reading here and let me know when you're done. So he read them and he was jaw on the floor, did not know what to say. He was like, are you kidding me? And I said, no, I'm not kidding you. So at that point I said, you know, I'm kind of done with playing nice with this lady. Like I've tried this long enough and I feel like ever since, you know, we started talking to her, she has been nothing but drama. Her story has changed multiple times. Maybe not the full, like the bullet points. Friend got stuck, sent James. He didn't make it. Three-way call happened. Blah, blah, blah. Jay, or, you know, Tank and Sherry. Or Tank and, excuse me, Tank and Gary went and rescued D. That was the consistency. But all this, the fine details changed multiple times. The time James left. the time, How long it took him to get to that intersection before he called on three-way. I mean, just everything else. All other details changed multiple times. And I said, and now this ring thing is just too much for me. I can't do it. And he said, do what you got to do. So I sent her a pretty nasty text. And I was like, you know, you got some explaining to do, Lucy. This is not adding up for me. You're telling me that he went missing wearing this ring. Yet this is the same ring that you gave my husband, you know, that you told my husband about the first time we spoke to you on the phone. And that you physically gave my husband when we were out there just a few weeks ago. And I was like, but I mean, I was putting in dates and times and all these things on her, right? Because I was taking great notes throughout all this. And she was normally pretty quick to respond to me. But this time, it took her 12 and a half hours to finally get back to me. At which point, she sent, she likes my message, which just further angered me. And I, w I went off. Um, I was very upset. I was very angry. How can you like, like, thumbs up something? that I'm asking you, like, I'm accused, I'm like, I'm sounding accusatory for a reason, and you are thumbs upping my, my questions about my missing father-in-law, like, that's a problem for me. She thumbs up that I go off, and a little while later, she comes back with, oh my gosh, I'm not the one who did that. I didn't have my phone for a while, and I, I was like, well, then you better be real careful about who has possession of your phone, because they're going to get you in trouble. Like, that's not acceptable. Considering the subject matter, that is not acceptable for a freaking thumbs up. Like, I'm, that's not going to fly here. So at that point that she back paddled and said to me, oh, about the ring, I must be mistaken. It must have been a different ring he was wearing when he went missing. Because the ring I gave your husband is a ring that he lost on our property before he went missing. And I found it after he went missing. And I sat in his chair that night and asked and just said out loud, you know, James, I found your ring. What do you want me to do with it? And his spirit told me to give it to John. That was the back paddle story I got regarding the ring. So as you can see, just from the start of the story, and there's so much more to it, um, that I will continue to cover as I go through these things, you know, with each video, I'll release more and more information. Um, but as you can see, I have reasons to think that something doesn't add up here, um, just based off of a 39 minute discussion. And there's so much more that goes behind that. Um, there are other, there, there's another body that gets recovered, another missing person, like, this whole thing gets very deep. So I do hope that you stick with us and you do continue to follow James's story and um, help us be his voice. Um, unfortunately, James has had his voice robbed from him and he can no longer speak for himself. He can no longer fight for himself and he can no longer try to attain justice for himself. But we here can. And, you know, we just need to stand up to this kind of stuff. It can't keep happening to our loved ones, not mine and not yours. Um, 
and no one say anything and it just be swept under the rug like it never happened. It definitely happened. I have a, a box of ashes in my living room that says different. So this happened and this is real. And my family is by far not the only family to go through the same, if not very, very similar ordeal. And it's just heart wrenching. And, um, it's a very overwhelming place with very few resources. And so it's very, very frustrating. And especially when you're not getting law enforcement to do proper investigation on something, it becomes even more, um, painful and you truly actually feel like you've already been, you know, victim. And now you're being re-victimized by law enforcement, the people that should help you. And a lot of these details I will get into further as the videos come along. But I did want to at least put James's story out there. I wanted people to understand who James Escalante was and what happened to him last year. James, and, James was, you know, a dad. He was a grandpa. He was a friend. He was a son. His parents are still living. He was a brother. He's got several brothers that are also alive. He was an uncle. He was an amazingly big-hearted person, and he is very loved, and he is very missed. And we just want the truth. We just want answers. And if it's warranted, we want justice. And until we get that, I will continue to scream from every rooftop I can get on. I will continue to be James's voice. So thank you again for joining. Um, like I said, this is the first of many videos to come and the, the plot thickens along and along. And so I hate to say that because it's not funny. It's not entertaining on any level. It's just, it's so wild that it almost feels like fiction, the happenings of this whole last 11 months. And so with that being said, please stay tuned. Please join us again and please Help us get James's face out there. Help us spread awareness of James's case. We There are power in numbers, and we need those numbers. We need people to come rally up with us and fight for justice for these people that are not being spoken up for out in the desert out there. So thanks again for watching. I will be making the next video uh, very soon, and I appreciate you.